Hello everyone, how are we doing today? So today we're going to be going into the next little video here in chapter five, which is focused on the complementation test. And we'll talk a little bit about something known as anticipation as well. So only two more videos left in this chapter. So after this one, we'll be talking about the environmental effects. Okay, so what is this complementation test? In this chapter, we've been talking about how, you know, two genes or multiple genes can affect one phenotype. So whether it's polygenic or epistasis or something like that. Uh, so this complementation test is used to determine whether or not it's multiple genes um, affecting one phenotype. So what it does is it looks at the ask if the alleles are at the same locus or if they're at different loci. So is this, you know let's say um, you know white is a mutant here in the in the fly eyes. Now, is that white caused by, you know, let's say this is gene A that causes this. Is it just a, you know, a homozygous recessive mutation that leads to the white eyes? Or is it two genes that interact that lead to the white eyes? So think about yellow labs. Uh, yellow labs have that, you know, recessive gene that prevents the pigment from being expressed in the hair. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at today on is it something like this or could there be two genes involved here, so A and B, whereas if either are recessive, so we'll just do homozygous dominant here, if either of these are recessive, does that lead to the wild type or the mutant version? So the best way to understand this complementation test is by going through an example here. So the example I'm using today are for the fly eyes. In this case, wild type are red, white are mutant. Uh, so now two independent white mutants are discovered. So, you know, you're breeding this fly colony and then you independently come across two white mutants. It's not if, you know, you're doing a cross and then two white mutants show up in that same set of progeny. It's if you're, they show up independently from each other. Uh, so the question is, are these white mutant mutants at the same locus? So did this mutation, if it's at the same locus, did it appear, you know, just by random chance in two different generations? Or could two different mutations at two different gene locations have caused this white mutation? So we want to think about this in terms of them being a double, well, not double, but two different genes. So in this case, assuming, you know, we have genes A and genes B. So if they're both homozygous dominant, or they could be, you know, heterozygous here, uh, they would have the wild type red eyes. Now, if either of the genes are recessive, so either A is recessive or B is recessive, it doesn't matter what the other one is, we are assuming those flies will have white eyes and be the mutants. So our question is, is this true? So, you know, we could have white eyes with, you know, this case, homozygous recessive of one gene. So is are these white eyes from two different genes or just the same mutation in that one gene? Uh, so the other, like I said, the other option here, so this, if it was at a single locus, this would be red. And then this would be white. So we're doing either or here. You know, within this white one, it could be different mutations as well. Like think of cystic fibrosis. It could be A1, A2, mutations, both leading to white or even even a, a more complex mixture of each recessive mutation leading to white as well. Uh, but it gets a little bit more complex, but it's still one gene. It's just not different loci. It's just different diversity within that one loci or locus. So how do we test this now? So you remember how we did test crosses before? It's kind of similar but different mentality here. So you cross both white mutants. So we already know these are both recessive to wild type as well. So recessive to wild type, meaning you cross these with a wild type, they're gonna be white again. Um, so here, cross both white mutants. So the cross is, you know, I'll write it out real quick. So right there would be the cross for this one. So all of these progeny would be this product. They would be, you could do the Punnett square if you really wanted, uh, but just you know, to show you what the results would be, they'd all be heterozygous. 
Now, based on what we know about genes and how they act, if each of these are heterozygous, like I've drawn here, they should be red. They should be the wild type. So, if heterozygous is red eyes, then the mutations are known as complement and are in different genes. So, complement, red eyes. So, now what if we get this result here? We think we're doing this cross, but we get white eyes. So, if all our white eyes and the mutations do not complement and are in the same gene. So, this is a very simple cross to do this, but it tells you a lot of information about what's happening here. So, like I, I drew up here then, um, so A underscore would be red, could be dominant or recessive there, and then A1 could be white, and then A2 would be white as well. So, this test provides a great amount of information on gene function and how they work together. You can, this is some of the early ways we've used to elicit, you know, simple biochemical pathways. Uh, think about that one example of uh, double recessive epistasis we talked about, where you have a snail, you know, you're producing color in this snail, and you're going from, you know, you have enzyme one, where you have, you know, white, you have enzyme one that's required, but the next result is still white, and then red is finally produced here. So, if this one is mutated, so let's say this one is, you know, little a, little a homozygous recessive here, that snail still remains white. However, if this one is recessive down here, that one's mutated, that snail remains white as well. So then, you know, that duplicate recessive epistasis, you can help start linking these here to help you solve them. Whereas the only way you can make red then is by having both of these working with a dominant trait. So kind of neat uh, how, that, how that could work there. But yeah, so great information on gene function and how they work together. You can know whether, you know, reasons for that mutation are two different genes, one gene, and it can help you, you know, you know figure a lot out about whether what that mutant state or disease state is. All right, so that's the complementation test. Uh, now to change thoughts a little bit, another thing I wanted to include in today's lecture is something known as anticipation. Uh, so anticipation is a temporal or time extension of Mendel. So this leads to mutations increasing with either susceptibility to the disease or age of onset in subsequent generations. So earlier expression or increased severity in subsequent generations. So one, in, one parent has the disease state. The offspring then, if they inherit the disease, they get it earlier and possibly more severe. If those children are able to then get to reproductive age and produce again, their children could get it even more early and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about this again later when we get to how uh, genetic mutations happen and repeats happen. Usually these anticipation sort of events occur due to increased number of repeats. So an example here I wanted to show is on Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a neurological disorder. It doesn't usually present itself until the individual is like 35 to 45 years old. And it's a number of, I think there are CG repeats, so cytosine and guanine repeats, and they you know, there's a section where they could, if they hit a certain point, it causes the disease state. Now, it's also a dominantly inherited disorder too. So a very severe disorder, but you don't think a dominantly inherited neurological disorder shouldn't be passed on. But the fact that it doesn't present itself until the individual's past, you know, you know, early on or past reproductive age, so a 45-year-old show, finally showing symptoms could have had a few children by then. Uh, so now you can do genetic testing to find out if you are a carrier of the disease, not a carrier, but if you have the disease and that can help you make uh, informed decisions on whether or not you want to have children, how you live your life and so forth. Some people might not want to know if they have it. So if you have a parent that has it, you have pretty much have a 50% chance of having it yourself. All right. So now how does this anticipation work here for Huntington? So what did I found this example from this paper here from 1995 uh, going over this in a way. So here, uh, red line means deceased. So we've uh, pedigrees. I know we haven't gone over pedigrees yet. Pedigrees will come up in chapter six, which is the next chapter here. But circles are female, squares are male. Uh, and this line represents, uh, you know, a relationship of mating. And then down here are the offspring that come off of it. So O here is a 
onset, age of onset, which is 34 years old. They didn't know the number of repeats on this one. Down here, R is the number of repeats. So the original you know, grandparent here had an age of onset of 34 years old, but that grandparent had one, two, three, four, five children. And well, actually six, I got this one over here. And they all had the disease as well. Their age of onsets varied too, 35, 40, 39, 35, 33, and 38. So not, you know, a massive difference. And here we also got repeat information. So 51, 48, 50, 50, 49. Pretty similar there as well. This individual uh, passed away earlier and they didn't get the repeat information right here. So now let's look at their children. So this individual had children and now, and let's, let's look at, they, so it looks like we don't have the information here as well. So onset here was 30, onset here was 18 and 22. And then this is that generation two. So 21, 16, and 31. So as you can see, a much earlier age of onset and 57 repeats, uh, 82 repeats, 61, 66, 58, 51. So the number of repeats are also increasing, which helps increase that age of onset. And then finally, we have a generation down here. Age of onset was nine years old and 75 um, repeats. So very, very early age of onset. And this is called an anticipation. Uh, so anticipating, meaning coming earlier, showing up earlier, both in severity and age of onset. So other examples of this include uh, fragile X syndrome, uh, myotonic dystrophy, muscular dystrophy, and spinocerebellar ataxia. So all of these are examples of anticipation. And that is included in this chapter because it's part of the gen um, extensions of Mendelian inheritance where, you know, it changes with each generation. So it's not just you get it at a certain age, it can also increase in severity as we go forward. It's not just a simple, you get it or you don't get it. It could also be multifactorial and in increasing it earlier. I know that was a bit different uh, from the complementation test, but I figured it was okay to include them in this same video here. So a short little video going over the complementation test. Again, a very important test in a Deciding whether or not a gene is separate or just a single um, locus. And then also we talked a little bit about anticipation, which we'll talk about later again for how these repeats occur when we get into uh, future chapters. But that's all I have for today. Next video, we'll be going over the environmental effects and how they could affect phenotype. Uh, so some of those are pretty neat to think about too. All right. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments and I'll see you all next time. Hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.